Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and our co-sponsor, Grub Street, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Daniel Hornsby, discussing his debut novel, Via Negativa, in conversation with Andrew Martin. Tonight's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's New Voices in Fiction series, presented with Grub Street, highlighting debut novelists, their work, and the writing process. Tomorrow, we are Thrilled to be hosting author Shruti Swami for a discussion of her debut story collection, A House is a Body, in conversation with Megha Majumdar. Learn more about our programming at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. We're so fortunate to be able to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times. We are so very grateful for continued support from our customers and organizations like Grub Street. This evening's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A button wherever it may live on your Zoom display, or you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of Via Negativa. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to this series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the link a chat in the chat, a link to our website's donation button. We greatly appreciate any and all support you were able to extend to us at this time. And lastly, as you may know, if you've participated in large virtual gatherings lately, technical issues might come up. We apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. And now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Daniel Hornsby holds an MFA in fiction from the University of Michigan, where he received Hopwood prizes for both short fiction and the novel, as well as an MTS from Harvard Divinity School. His acclaimed stories and essays have been featured in publications such as the Los Angeles Review of Books, Electric Literature, the Missouri Review, and Joyland. Andrew Martin is the author of Early Work, a New York Times notable book of 2018, and the story collection Cool for America, for which we had the great pleasure of hosting a, a recent event as well. His stories and nonfiction writing have been featured in a variety of places, including the Paris Review, The Atlantic, the New York Review of Books, Harper's, and elsewhere. Tonight, they'll be discussing Daniel's debut novel, Via Negativa, an undaunted, heartfelt portrait of a homeless holy man in exile, which Britt Bennett calls, quote, a beautiful and meditative exploration of shattered faith. Following the aimless travails of Father Dan, an eccentric priest recently dismissed by his diocese for insubordination, Via Negativa is not only brimming with that always delightful combination of the sacred and the profane, but is brilliantly attentive to the circumstances in which the two seemingly antithetical constructions cannot exist without each other. Transforming his Toyota Camry into a traveling monk cell, Father Dan embarks on an extended pilgrimage trading spiritual oblivion for sudden onset asceticism, stepping off, stopping off at many an iconic roadside attraction and encountering many interesting people and one wild animal who I shall leave you to meet through your own reading of this book. This brief novel is a feat of style and imagination and we are so honored to host this event tonight. Without further ado, I will now turn things over to Daniel and Andrew. Thank you so much for that introduction, Benjamin, and just for you know organizing the event. Um, I also want to thank the Harvard Bookstore and Grub Street for sponsoring this, um, and also to uh, Harvard Divinity School for helping helping get the word out a little bit. Um, I'm just gonna dive in, read a little bit from the opening beat here. It'll be short, so you won't have to endure much, and then uh, Andrew and I will get chatting. So this you'll actually meet the animal. So here we go. So chapter one. Somebody hit a coyote and I pulled over to the shoulder to take a look at it. I'd watched it bounce off a minivan 20 yards ahead of me, a gold smudge. At first I thought it might have been a paper bag tossed out the window, or maybe an old t-shirt, until I saw its big yellow eyes and tail flopping around as it skittered onto the gravel, rolling like a stuntman on fire. By the time I walked up to it on the shoulder, it was lying on its side, taking quick shallow breaths and staring up past my head. One of its legs looked like it had an extra joint. I reached out to touch it and it didn't bite. I ran my finger along its hind leg and it didn't move. With a spare blanket from the trunk, I wrapped him up. I could now see he was male for whatever that's worth then stuck him in the back seat next to the bucket, the books and my duffel bag. 
I grabbed two of the books and shoved the rest into the footwell so they wouldn't shift onto him. I set the coyote's head on the selected writings of origin of Alexandria and wedged my collection of the venerable beads homilies between the seatbelt and the blanket to brace the animal's ribs and diffuse the pressure of the strap when I buckled him in. He was panning hard, so I poured some water into his mouth and, after I made sure his tongue had drawn it in, poured a little more onto the blanket for him to suck on if he got thirsty soon. Before I drove off, I stuck half a neurovam in his mouth and heard it fizzle on his tongue. Origen, that spiritual genius of the second and third centuries, says we can go up or down from age to age. Someone could be a monk, and then, after a snobby life of chastity and starvation, come back as an angel. Or you could go backward. You might come to as an animal, a pigeon, a rat, coyote, and then drop to demon, or go down to whatever is below that. The idea behind this being that at the beginning of time, we're all made of fire and torn, turned toward God in constant sizzling contemplation, burning up his divine fumes. Most minds, with the sole exception of Jesus, he says, turned from him, became distracted and cooled. From then on, we were stuck with our husky bodies. Now we can go up or down, but eventually those at the bottom will climb their way back up to God when time calls it, calls it quits. I haven't read Origin in a while, admittedly, but I'm pretty sure that's the gist of his cosmic scheme, which he would say is somewhat metaphorical anyhow. Thanks to a couple first millennium controversies among the monasteries of Lower Egypt, Origen was never canonized. There are pictures of him standing at the pulpit, preaching to a congregation of saints, Augustine, Ambrose, a haloed crowd in which he's the only one with no light shooting out of his head. Somewhere in Illinois, I, I changed the blanket. The coyote had pissed and shit in it. A good sign, I figured, but the car was beginning to smell. He left a foamy stripe of puke on origin and some of it smeared onto bead. I wrapped him up in one of my towels at a rest stop. He was as light as a throw pillow. He didn't move at all. The back leg looked pretty bad, bent slightly the wrong way. When I touched it, he jerked out of his daze and snapped his jaws. I'd need to set the bone. A woman stepped out of the van park next to me. <clears throat> Got yourself a little buddy there, father? She walked over, and before I could stop her, she stroked his nose. Doesn't like to travel. I gave him one of those pills. He's a little out of it. I can tell. Well, I hope he gets there safe. You too. God bless. I buckled him back in and threw the blanket into the trash. B jo joined the monastery of Monk Wearmouth when he was seven. As an oblate, a pure oblatus, literally a child offered, Part of a practice of dedicating prepubescent boys to monastic life. Probably wasn't the best for child development, but the monks who did this moved through scripture like fish and water, my theology professor used to say. I went to the minor seminary at 14, St. John Bosco's. This was in Indiana in the 60s, but there are still a few places like that. It's the closest thing to being an oblate you can get in recent memory. There are a lot of oblates in the Middle Ages. It simplified inheritance to send off a second-born son, or ninth-born in my case, to a monastery before he reached puberty. Many of the best medieval scholars were oblates. William of Ockham was an oblate, so was St. Boniface, I think. I roomed with three other boys, and we were far from little beads or Ockhams. We found the room where the older priests kept their whiskey, gin, and cartons of cigarettes and broke into it all the time. Sometimes we'd hitchhike into Indianapolis and try to meet girls. More than once, a couple of us brought some back to the seminary and made out in the grounds charitable shadows. The priests didn't object to this as much as you might think. The boys were trying to get one last look at what they'd be giving up should they graduate to the major seminary and go through with ordination. I don't know what the girls were trying to get. The seminary was not a romantic place. Everywhere you looked, a saint or an angel was watching you, staring up into the side the way they always do. Last night, a couple hours after I picked up the coyote, I stopped at a campground off the highway. I parked the car next to, the, to a tree inscribed with the message, JB was here, buck, Ron. I almost stepped on a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket. Some animal had torn it apart. The colonel's face stared back at me, mutilated and sinister like a zombie's. I unloaded my supplies from the Camry. They'd given me two weeks to move out of the rectory, and in that time I ran a number of tests. I took a bucket and one of those circular cushions they make you wear when you break your tailbone. And with these, I made a kind of chamber pot. I soldered together a foldable grill. I have a master's in art. I've always been pretty good at making things. Over the years, I kept, kept picking up new crafts. 
worked with pewter, clay, wood, PVC pipe, and in one disastrous project, human hair. So it was fun for me to put these things together. Some, something in my knee popped when I reached in to grab my tent. It was so loud, even the coyote turned his head to see what was going on, but it didn't hurt too bad. I'd be all right as long as I didn't fully extend my leg. Despite his curiosity about my knee, the coyote was still pretty dazed. I put on a pair of leather driving gloves and bound him up in the towel, leaving his broken leg sticking out like a kettle spout. I buckled him back in so he couldn't turn and bite me. And then I took some plaster uh, gauze from my first aid kit and started wrapping the broken leg with it. The coyote didn't like this and started wriggling, but then he passed out because of the pain, I think. With him lying still, I managed to get the leg set pretty straight and used up most of the gauze because it seemed likely he'd chew through it if there wasn't enough. I drizzled water on the wrap so they would hold, then turned up the air so the plaster would set faster. Once he came to, I gave him the other half of the pill. When I was done, he looked like one of those mum mummified cats you see pictures of in National Geographic. With the coyote bundled up, I pitched my tent. Lying there in the dark, I thought I heard something or someone moving through the trees about 50 yards away. I pulled out my flashlight and shined it into the brush, but there wasn't anything. If you're alone long enough, your mind begins to populate the world. I think that's why the Desert Fathers, St. Anthony, Arsenius, were always battling demons. I'm not saying those demons weren't real. I just think you have to be alone for a long time if your brain is going to be able to see anything special. I grabbed one of the books from the car and tried to read it by flashlight. After mindlessly skimming a few pages, I felt something sticky on the spine. Some of the coyote's bile had caked onto it. I wiped it, off the, I wiped it off on the side of the tent. I fell asleep about an hour after that. All right. Oh, man. Dan, I love this book so much. Oh, thanks. I, I never get tired of telling you that, but I also just genuinely, I mean, it's, it's my favorite book. I've, my favorite new novel I've read in a long time, and it's just so funny and so great and i'm so so glad it's out in the world for people to read it now no, thanks. No, thanks. Uh, and uh, and the opening i feel like what's so cool about it having just well spent the day rereading it while on a road trip with my uh, coyote dog in the back seat uh, which really brought the whole thing to life um is how much of the book is sort of so many of the concerns of the book are like compressed and sort of like rehearsed in that opening in a lot of ways, like sort of the, um, the way you bring in these old biblical texts or these and the desert fathers, the way that you kind of contrast theology with sort of like the, the more like base things of the world, like, you know, excrement and coyote bile and all these things. It's like, it's very much a book about sort of like the holy and the base and how they interact, I think. Um, that's my, that's my idea. Um, but, uh, I guess I was, what I, what really struck me while hearing you read it was how much, you know, theology and, and history is, is in the book. And I thought you might want to talk about the origins of the book and, and, you know, also maybe your Harvard Divinity School time, since we're talking, uh, through Harvard bookstore and, and how that affected the way you thought about fiction or how, what influence that had on the work. Yeah, there are a couple of things that kind of came together, I think, when uh, I, I started thinking, oh, maybe I have some kind of like novel -y thing I want to work on with this. Um, one thing was I was taking this class about um, like Christian contemplative practice um, with Stephanie Paulsell, who teaches over at HDS, uh, who's just like so brilliant and full of wisdom that I felt, I was just like, oh, it was such a, an amazing course. And we read um, uh, the way of, you know, the way of the pilgrim, you know, or the way of a pilgrim, the uh, 19th century Russian text. It's in um, Salinger, you, you know, yeah, refers yeah, to it sometimes, yeah. right? Me and Zoe are obsessed with it, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the Jesus prayer shows up in there. Um, and so you have this, this pilgrimage um, there, and I was kind of thinking about pilgrimages a lot. Um, and then there was also, my mom had told me about a, a family friend who was a priest who was, um, like living out of his car for a while. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was such an interesting kind of, um, start to something. 
And so I made up this guy that would do this kind of the same thing. Um, yeah. Very different than this family friend. Um, but would also like think of themselves in terms of like maybe the desert fathers or some of these other, you know, mystics in kind of Christian history. Um, and the more I thought about it, you know, I started writing maybe, and the, yeah, yeah. A little bit, maybe the des what the desert, the desert fathers, who they are. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, a, really it's it was this kind of like first real Christian monastic movement. You have people who like St. Anthony is kind of considered one of the first, uh, he goes out into the desert alone in lower Egypt by himself, um, you know, battling demons, um, praying all day, not eating anything, you know, nibbling some salt occasionally. People would go to him, ask for some advice. Um, his life is, you know, his, his like, you know, life of, life of Antony is written by Athanasius, who's an early Christian bishop. Um, and, you know, he inspires all of these people to kind of follow and they have, they organize in different kinds of communities. Um, so you have um, anchorites like Antony, Arsenius is another one. Um, and then you have Cenobites, which live in communities, but they still kind of isolate, you know, um, in their cells all day and pray. And so this is before like the Benedictine monasteries and that, that movement, but definitely has some influence on it Yeah, and inspires it. Yeah. So, but I like that because it's like, it's those monks were working in, in something messier and kind of, uh, older it's like there's less mythology about them i think in the popular imagination mm -hmm. um and you know you can read the sayings of the desert fathers thomas merton has his own kind of edited version of them but they're they're weird and they're really a a, pro a product of this hellenistic world in a way that you know later texts aren't obviously um yeah so that's definitely an influence on how this priest sees himself and a lot mm -hmm. of them would try to you know they would heal hyenas jackals uh all kinds of animals. So it's some, it seems like something that this guy would do if he was into them. Yeah. Well, what, what seems like so striking to me about the book is that it's about, it, it, it treats faith. And, and I think there's this, there's this sense that Catholicism is very monolithic, right? Yeah. That the church is the church and it, you know, there are, it is like, that is unchanging, like its own, you know, the church's own, PR once this as was often like this is an unchanging that has been the same for its entire existence since you know it was founded on the rock. Um, but what I love about this book is that it's very much about the ways in which all this stuff is still very much up for grabs um, for this character for Father Dan, um, and also just the little subtleties throughout about different ways, different ways of being a priest and talking about the pre-Vatican II versus today talking about different periods of conservatism and um, liberalism in the church. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you were thinking about that, about discussing like the sort of state of, well, these are a few questions at once, but sort of the yeah. state of Catholicism, whether that was something you were interested in and two, how you were interested in exploring like sort of the personal faith of this one character and how it evolves or shifts or changes. Sure. Um, I guess kind of one point of entry into that, I guess, is, you know, if you grow up Catholic or kind of Catholic adjacent, um, you, there's, there's so much that you like, you learn, and this isn't necessarily bad, but the, the kind of history that you learn is so pointillistic, right? Mm -hmm. That there's like, there's Jesus, the apostles, and then little kind of, okay, there's a point maybe in the 13th century uh, there's a point in the 16th century, you know, and you just like, you, you kind of learn it through these lives of saints, mostly, like, if you want to get a sense, there's not a lot of continuity. Um, and that leaves out a lot of stories and a lot of expressions of religious life, and maybe what I would call a kind of like spiritual creativity. Mm. Um, and so for me, as I kind of learned more and more about these little movements kind of scattered through time, um, I found them really interesting. You know, you have like the Beguines organizations uh, or groups of women who opted out. Like they would just say, you know what? I'm not going to have sex with my husband. We're going to live communally for a little while. And then they would kind of go in together and bring in speakers. Meister Eckhart, you know, preached to yeah. them. 
Beatrice of Nazareth preached to them. Um, and so there were all these figures that like kind of aren't in the kind of like, you know, mainstream Catholic narrative, yeah. but they offer a lot of really interesting takes on, uh, you know, on, on, on the nature of reality, on the nature of uh, experiencing the divine. Um, and so for my priest, he kind of, you know, sees himself as being arty. And so he, you know, like any artist, he's looking to other artists, other people who are spiritually creative. And so yeah. he has his own kind of lineage that he draws from, his own heroes and his own little, I think in the book, he, they're kind of like his beetles of spirituality. Yeah. You know? But also people like Prince, you know, like he's, yeah, he's yeah, yeah. kind of a hip priest. And that's how we all kind of are like, right? Like, like you as a novelist, as a, a writer of short stories, like you have your own kind of your weird bag of people that you kind of go to. Right. Like, okay, I'm going to like try to do this like technical Bolaño thing here and let it, you know what I mean? Like you have, and I think that for him, it's, he kind of looks at it that way. No, it's, it's true. And I think like one of the things that's exciting to me, I feel like there's a world in which you like, oh no, a book about a priest, it's going to be, and like no disrespect to Marilyn Robinson, but it's going to be this like very staid, like very, like kind of like deep, like recessive is, is the word that one thinks of sometimes. Yeah. But this he's so active, you know, like he, he's out there, he's like meeting new people. The whole book is really like a series of encounters with people. And I feel like that's, to me, what's so exciting about it is that this is a priest, well, who is, you know, at the end of his career, but is also like, is still like very much searching and is, is looking. What, well, I wanted to talk about parables. So, because I feel like what he keeps doing is like encountering new people and every time he does, there's a story emerges. And it, it feels to me like very, you know, clearly sort of like a parabolistic structure, yeah, you know. Yeah. He encounters a guy and he like tells him the story of, of this experience he had. Um, th there's one amazing sequence where a guy tells him a story about uh, Carrie Underworld and uh, a dream he has in which she emerges from the ocean like covered in eyes. And it's just like this incredible thing. I wonder if you want to talk about parables and like their relationship or maybe how, how they function in the book and how the, how you think these encounters function in the book. Yeah. Um, you know, I like you read, you know, if you read like the little flowers of St. Francis or, you know, there are a couple good kind of film versions of, of that too. You see these like little episodes, right. And they're kind of, they're strung together and there are some subtle arcs, but they're, they kind of come out with time. Um, and so my justification, I guess, for something being so episodic was kind of borrowing from some of these kind of lives of saints where, because that's kind of how they are. It's like, oh, he converted a wolf and he preached to some birds, you know? Um, but there were a couple of things. So there were a couple of writers I really admire who would deploy these little tricks. And so like one being Ishiguro, right? He has, he's like the master of the kind of evasive narrator. Yeah. And one of the real emotional pleasures of reading a novel like The Remains of the Day or something is seeing over that narrator's head and then yeah. kind of accessing their pain despite them. Um, and Rachel Cusk is someone else who like, I mean, there's so many people who, you know, read the Outline trilogy and want to just write that. I think I was one for several years. It really kind of derailed me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and she has this kind of, like, she likes that too, where the narrator almost erases herself entirely. And you get mm -hmm. like, just like the tiniest crumbs of information over the course of three books. And I like, I found those so effective. And I realized that there, there's a way that that could kind of play with negative theology. Um, mm -hmm. the, you know, the via negativa, the title, the way of denial. Yeah. And that this idea that like, you know, there's a reason why he's not presenting these things. There's a, there's a kind of like, it's a kind of a emotional tactic to not talk about uh, what hurts him, what matters most to him, um, and to avoid responsibility and accountability in relationships. Um, yeah. Well, I, and what, what, this, what, what you managed to do, sorry, did I, did I interrupt you? No, 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 no. I, th I think what the, what the really neat thing that, that that structure gives you is like 
it's simultaneously, it's a real page turner because you do, the book leaves these, it begins, there's these mysteries, you know, like we know he's going to see this old priest and we know he's going to see his friends. And so like, it, it is a quest. We know there's a journey and we sort of slowly over the course of the book, learn more and more about like why he's going on this journey. But at the same time, that makes it, it's still like my favorite genre of book is like the hanging out book, you know, the book that's yeah. not just like, everything is like contributing to like the plot. And in this book, you know, like a lot of it is just like great scenes between strangers, between new people, but we know that there's something coming, you know, there's this looming suspense, which is like such a great feeling to know you're going to like, you're getting to hang out, but there's going to be like a reward too, to the hanging out. Um, and I wondered in a, to get crafty for a minute, like how you thought about um, structure, like the book is so perfectly sort of dense and calibrated. And yeah. I wondered like, how you achieve that? Did you, did you overwrite and then pare it down? Did you want it to always be like sort of a pointillistic episode by episode thing? Like, how did you, how did you make this? How did it happen? Yeah. I think, well, I love, and I also hate those uh, kind of like geometrically abstracted novel structures. Do you know what I'm talking mm. about? Like, uh, like to the lighthouse has the H, right? Where you have like one day, and it's hyper compressed, and then you have time passes, and it's this little kind of ki kickstand, and then you know another day, uh, another compressed day, right? Hate and that. Then, no, I love it. But I also, when you're like trying to write a novel, you're like, how do you write an H? Do you no. know what I mean? Like to me, it's it's like, and I mean Virginia Woolf is like the best at that kind of almost mystical abstraction. I mean, she'll even have like a dark little wedge inside of her, you know, and you're like, oh, that's just perfect, you know. Um, and so I, I guess there are kind of two ways at this, but one is like, I realized I needed a kind of shape like that as I had some of these episodes and I had some of these centers of narrative gravity, like his friend, Paul, who I won't really get into here, um, or this, this older priest plot yeah, or the coyote. Yeah. Um, but once I had all of them kind of in the soup, I was like, I need a way to, figure this out for myself like how do I return what am I returning to and how can I add some more information for the reader and for Dan how's that going to come out so I kind of settled on this thing that was already in the book which is a labyrinth mm. and you know like the the if, if you think these kind of contemplative mats right or mazes um but it kind of for me it's, mine is kind of a snail shell and so imagine the events of, of his past as like cardinal points Right, so one, two, three, four. And then the narrative kind of snakes around and we touch one here and we touch one here, we touch one here. Then we get a little bit closer and we get a little more insight and we kind of keep coming until we arrive maybe more at the center of his pain and his memory. Um, yeah. And so that was one way that I kind of justified the structure and kind of figured out, okay, these later sections need to do more because we're getting closer to this, the center of things. Yeah. Well, that's true. And like, I think also you kind of like warm us up or, or you kind of like soften up the reader, I think with like a lot of humor or early on, especially like, I feel like it's like one of those things where you're like, you feel comfortable and you, you really get to like this guy and you really get to feel for him. And so then as, and then it draws you, he's not just this like numb shell of a, of a tortured man. He's, he's like a really winning sort of narrator. Um, not, not, um, in your face about it, but you know, you're charmed and you're, you're engaged. And then it, I think that that structure makes total sense because you're, you're, but you didn't answer my question about like, how did you actually, did you through write it? I mean, like, did, or, or did you I did a version just on index cards yeah. um, and like little bites. So I'd be like, okay, yeah, that talk about the index cards. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So some of it would be like uh, a paragraph on origin kind of in his voice. And some of it would be about, you know, oblets. Um, there'd be something just about the, like, physical, like, how do you wrap up a coyote? Yeah. Because um, I really don't want, like, an animal, especially here. And this is something I always struggle with. It's like, we share the, the planet with animals. If we overly metaphorize them, we do them a tremendous disservice. Mm. Um, so I didn't want to make it, like, the this symbol. Of, like, I wanted to make the coyote embodied 
and Be very real and physical yeah um and so i would kind of piece these together and it started out being much more atomized which you see like every other book that comes out is like done in like here's a tiny little s- section with some asterisks and you know what i mean so okay. it started out looking a lot like that and then you know, I would try to just combine them and see how I can make things fit, see the arc of the chapter, see the way that, see its shape, and then find the pieces that kind of would meet some of the sub themes mm-hmm. and rearrange them a little bit. Um, yeah, so it started very atomized and kind of gradually these things fused together. And, uh, and then my agent and editor helped me fuse them even more. I think like the number of chapters just kept shrinking until you know the final version um, it's funny you think that, like i i love the you know like i mean i feel like they're like the, the most like it is one of like our our achievements of like this period is like everyone there's every other book you read is like in discrete paragraphs full of quotations and stuff but but i yeah. love that this book feels like it sort of partakes of that genre but also like puts more meat on the bones or like just like insists on giving it a little bit more connective tissue. Like it doesn't, it doesn't rely on the profundity of the individual paragraphs in a way that can be a little bit like, okay, that was a good paragraph, but like, do we need all that white space? Before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like those beats of rest that just signify like, this is meaningful, but like every, like a mic drop, every paragraph, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's just um, a really I'm, up to as a writer, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, cause you want to have really good paragraphs. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my wife Alice Boland, the the essayist, the brilliant essayist Alice Boland. Oh yeah, uh, I heard her. Her paragraphs are amazing, and sure. I always like. And we talk about that sometimes. Like you really aspire towards like a really like a really good paragraph, you know, that like just does a, a couple things. Um, but yeah, so I think what I tried to do is like increasingly make each part justify its place. So that if like the pure oblatus stuff, I think is a good example. Like talking about the oblates in the early chapter, its etymology, a child offered, gets at a little bit of, you know, some of I think is a little bit of a note of like, the the real child sacrifice of the past. I mean, for a long time, but if you think about the Catholic Church in America, it's like we were sacrificing children, you know, and offering children up for this thing. To the priesthood at, at a very young age. Or even just ch- children as victims and the kind yeah. of silence around it. Um, no, absolutely. Well, and, and there's, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like it's really interesting when you, there's like, it, 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 it takes until, I don't remember what page, like maybe page 50 to, to have the character or maybe even later for the character to say like, I almost quit the church in the wake of, of like the high profile sex scandals. Cause you're sort of waiting as as a reader reading a book about a Catholic priest in 2020, you're like, right. when when is he going like, to reflect on on this fact? And then it, it's interesting how you withhold it, and then you know, and then it really is reckoned with in a very very serious way. Um, I wanted to before we go to questions from the audience, I did want to do like one one moment of like I think the kind of like higher stoner wisdom uh, that one is I think like obligated to have while reading this book that I just kept thinking constantly about how the book is, is about like sort of, as I was saying at the beginning, like the distinctions between like the body and like, hu- like whether how to feel about your body and other people as humans and as people versus sort of your higher calling and the sort of more mystical calling. And I feel like the moment in the book that really captures that is like, I call it like the parable of the nudists. Um, when the guy is, you know, he's out in the desert, like kind of trying to have a vision um, and it sort of plays almost like a, a joke and he sees these like two naked bodies dancing in the night and he's like, oh, that was my vision. And then the next morning the, the uh, you know, counselor guy is like, oh yeah, no, there's a nudist colony down the road. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, and his reaction though is like, well, that's just as good. Like that, that, that counts. Um, yeah. And I wondered, I wondered if you could just make a minute about those, maybe that question of like sort of humanism versus transcendent transcendentalism and and how you were thinking about those those questions yeah well you know there's like there are a lot of people who it's kind of like oh you want to see uh you people yeah you know, we, we all know these people like they want to go to burning man or like even in a more 
we you probably know more people are just like, yeah, I want to take acid, do a bunch of mushrooms and kind of chase mystical experience that way. You know, like there, and I think a lot of us are in pursuit of something like that, something profound that way. Yeah. Um, but part of what makes that like a satisfying experience is that it kind of like animates the mundane mm. where you're like, oh my gosh, a tree is just the ground reaching for the sky. I'm so high, you know, like, that like there that like I think you know for for a lot of the mystics and I don't mean to that, that lumps together a lot of people from a lot of different cultural backgrounds and times but there is something about it's like not looking out beyond the world but looking for something that is already kind of there and kind of grounded in in what is created right that there is something kind of miraculous to that um, and you think about Thomas Merton in you know, Louisville, Kentucky, standing on his mystical experience, the defining mystical experience of his life is standing in a shopping district on 4th and Walnut with people walking by and just feeling overwhelmed with love for them, you know? And that's deeply moving and that is mystical, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's something kind of miraculous about like just a, a body that it exists in front of you, you know? Um, yeah, so that maybe is my own like worldview leaking in there but like you know jesus said like the kingdom of heaven is at hand that it and you know some people will say that it's here you know and to be created by us seems pretty good i'll take it i mean it seems like we're not doing a good job no i mean like it could be better uh <laughs> could, like B plus. use a little tuning <laughs> uh Maybe a, an overhaul well that was shoot well i mean well because i think like the priests in this book do drugs. I mean, that to me was like one of the sort of striking things about it is, is like, and I was like, it's not treated as some massive sacrilege that they, when they're in seminary, they like take shrooms and go to church. It, it's not, they're not doing it to desecrate the church. They're yeah. doing it to like try to get at something to like sort of add on to the experience, you know, to like boost, to boost it even more to, to like to a higher spiritual plane. And I found that really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like one of these things is like these guys, even, you know, these in the minor seminaries, so they're like high school kids essentially. Yeah. Um, but you know, they both want to like opt out a little bit. And like some people, I think they like drop out into something more countercultural. And for them, they, I, <laughs> they're a little bit like too, they they miss that boat a little bit, I think just by living in Indiana where they were. Um, and so that was yeah. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that they, that was kind of their way, I think is, is chasing like divine union or whatever, or like at least even the priesthood as a way, cause they didn't fit. Um, yeah. yeah. Um. Well, it's also the post-Vatican II moment where it's like, maybe I can do both. Like, maybe I can be a priest and, and also... And they're kind of rebelling from... They're, yeah, there's, there's some rebellion from, like, the minor seminary discipline as well. That they're kind of... And I, there was a, one of, like, the partner of one of my teachers um, at Kansas State. He went to a minor seminary in Arkansas. And so, you know, it's like this stuff there's some roots there's some truth in some of it not the not the shrooms but just drinking and smoking and stuff like that so yeah yeah um well it all feels i don't know we should go to questions from the audience soon but i, I feel like one of the things that i love about it is that it's like i was talking the other day to another writer friend about like i don't know when like younger people try to write older people sometimes it's just like he felt so old and his old bones made him sad <laughs> yeah 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 the old. old bones. Alice and I. Alice introduced me to the old bones. I told that for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> These old um, bones keep getting older and older. Yeah. And I, I just love that this. You know, the priest is an older man, but it's like we're we're in his mind, and he's thinking about shit, and it's not. It 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 really it's it's a very generous portrait, I think, of of like how one thinks and how a person ages, and 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 it feels like very real and, and not at all talking down or in any way sort of like I don't know imagining it as like some, some terrible thing that makes me happy I'm glad you feel that way I like did not put any aging stuff like 
no aches or pains at all in the first draft because I did not want any old bones. And then a friend read the book and they're like, he's sleeping in his car. He's 70 years old. Like yeah. his back hurts. Uh, so yeah. I, I, I sprinkled some in there, but I kind of like, I try to give him cause like he pulls his, pulls something in his leg or he, you know, jerks his back because I was just so averse to the idea that he would just be like my old bones. Ah. You know? Yeah. 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 Um, it looks like we've got a bunch of questions. Maybe our friend and host Ben would like to come and uh, materialize. And, uh, ask. Ooh, from here. Okay. Um, great. So I am going to start with this question because it is pure poetry. So I'm going to start with a question from Brent Nobles, who asks, excellent read, Dan. I really admire the sophistication of the humor, the mystical iconography, and the way Father Dan balances cowardice and gravitas in what's ultimately a very risky mission for him. It reinvents the Great American Road Trip in such an ontologically powerful but still incredibly fun way. Can you talk a little bit about how your own road trips may have informed the story? Have you personally encountered prairie wizards, pyromaniac teens, giant balls of paint on the open asphalt? I love it. I love the blurb at the beginning there. That's just so well put and beautiful um, and generous. Uh, yeah, so I, the Prairie Wizard thing I took from, I have some friends, you know, I went to school in Kansas, so I went to Kansas State for my undergrad, and um, I knew a bunch of guys who, lived, you know, obviously my friends were all from Kansas in college, and uh, one of the guys would tell me about what he and his twin brother um, called Prairie Wizards, which were, you know, what, what they are in the, in the novel, which are you know, Vietnam vets usually who are kind of living off the land. Um, and that like, they would look out for them and kind of watch for them. Their dad called him, called them Prairie Wizards. And so that for a while they thought they were actually, you know, practitioners of magic. Um, but for some of the roadside stuff, I really just wanted that to be like, uh, kind of a weirdly mundane, form of pilgrim pilgrimage shrines you know that like like the reason you would go see a ball of paint or the reason you would go see the world's largest concrete prairie dog um in kansas is like kind of the same reason you would go see like catherine of sienna's head or uh you know someone else's withered little toe in a golden box um which is just to have like be like i share the world with these like magical wonderful things and you get to like kind of brush up against whatever infinity is there um yeah and so i think like for me it's like if i'm interested in something if i really like it like in some kind of sincere way i have to make fun of it a little bit to kind of balance that out so that you can actually like get that affection you know in the in the, in the book at least um, so I have a lot of affection for those things. And I think they're kind of fun the way they try to animate what is otherwise a fairly, no offense, but like kind of boring landscape, famously boring landscape. I don't think it's actually boring, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I, that was rambly, but you, you, I, hope, I hope that answers. Only that. Answer question, I think. So um, here's another question. You were in a band, a great one. And I was wondering if listening to or making music shapes your fiction writing at all. Well, that's really nice. Um, yeah, I, I think it's nice to have a couple things to like bounce between two things. Um, but I think like with like songwriting, I love like a, an ironic speaker of a song where, you know, they say something and you know the opposite is true. Um, and I, well, I guess, I guess, how can I put this? I think that like there are some things with like rhythm and phrasing and songwriting that can be actually very helpful in prose. And I think that there's like a certain kind of like way that like, you know, a couplet or something can kind of set up and deliver on a kind of joke or, or something in a song. And that like paragraphs can kind of do the same thing or sentences can kind of do the same thing. So I think they definitely talk to each other. Um, and it's nice to be able to just bounce from one to the other when you're just obsessing over the same thing over and over again. You just turn to, you know, write a silly song about being the reincarnation of Elvis or something. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so here's a question. 
after you've spent so much time and energy in developing characters, is it difficult to turn it off after the story is written? For example, have you continued to think about Dan's life after his trip? Yeah, I always hated when people would say like, my characters are real to me. They're so, cause it's like, they're made up of words. They're made out of words. Um, but uh, do, do, do the two of you know about tulpas? I don't think so. There's a kind of like fan culture online where people will kind of deliberately manifest into being these like, kind of like fan fiction, but in real life. So you like create an imaginary friend and then it is real to you. You do all of these kind of rituals to make them more and more real. So you write from their point of view, you, and then slowly they talk to you. Um, and I do think like if you spend a lot of time with a character, you do like, you can get into a nice flow where you're like hearing a voice and understanding how they would speak. And then you kind of, is that true for you, Andrew? Like, do you, cause you've worked with some of the same characters. Oh yeah. I've, I've come back to them. I, yeah. Because I like was so interested in in continuing to like kind of figure out their deal, but I think that the the big difference between like a a tulpa, if you will, maybe, and like yeah. a character in a book is that you have to like even an individual story or or a novel, even if they're if you're going to continue to see the same character, like they have to have like you have to close the the story, you have to like tell their you know that story of them, yeah, in a way, and so it's like. People, I feel like when they, when sometimes when you, when people ask that, it's like, well, I feel like the characters kind of go away once yeah. they're, like, once they like get their closure and then maybe they come back and they like have a new thing, but almost like that version of them is gone now or something. That's like, kind of how I feel. Even with Dan, it's some people ask like, what's in the bush? Is he going to make this choice? And it's like, I don't know. I feel like he and I were driving together and then he went off this way and I went off this way. And it's like, I wish him the best but I like that is the end of our, my relationship with him. Yeah. As far as like what happens next in his life. I hope he does good things and I hope he has a great life, but that's just, it's, it's over for us. You know what I mean? It sounds like I'm breaking up with him. Doesn't it? It does sound like that. It's like, you know, Dan, you were great. Uh, you had some problems for sure, but we spent a lot of great time together and let's just let that, let's just let it go and be friends. <laughs> You never know, man. Twenty years from now, like the sequel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the sequel. Right. He's ninety years old. He has two guns. Yeah. <laughs> more priest, more coyote. <sighs> All right. So here is a question from here is a question from Alice Boleyn who asks: Do you have practical tips for writing fiction with note cards? Hmm. I like the note cards because they, you, ha it's like you, it's like you can fill one of those. You can do that. You know, if you have like a, even if I have like a whole page on a legal pad, I have to like chop it up into little pieces with line, like grid it out because it's like, I fill that. I have a kind of uh, shape for it. Even if it spills over a little bit, it's fine. Um, but the port like the fact that they're so portable, you know, I was working as a waiter when I was writing a lot of this. And so the ability to just kind of whip one of those out, if I had, you know, I was like supposed to be folding napkins or something, the convenience of that is great. Um, but yeah, there's it's something really nice because then you can kind of, there's it makes things a little more modular. And then you can try new orders, um, shuffle them a little bit, and you still have the thing. Um, Did stuff move, move like a lot? Was there anything that was like either later, much later or much earlier that you decided to like to shift around? Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it moved a lot. I think even like just up until maybe the end, you know, um, just a memory would make more sense somewhere else and mm -hmm. you kind of like smoosh them together. Yeah. They definitely became more kind of amorphous and blob like. And so things that, to me, I'm like, that is a note card. It's just part of a larger suite now. That's really interesting. I, I like the note card approach. I've done like notebooks and legal pads too. I try to, with new projects, I try to mix up whatever I'm writing on so I can think a little differently. And do you feel like it changes the, sorry, I'm, t I'm now asking you. No, questions. no, no. Do you feel like that? I feel like that's so interesting because I often write in 
notebooks. And I, and I do feel like the way something is written does change how, how it comes out sometimes, like even in does. subtle ways, like just the way that you write it or the way you think it through or something. Well, like this new thing I'm working on, I was like this notebook, I'm going to outline and I'm going to go start to finish and have like a plot <laughs> that I know. And I think it, it has changed it kind of shape. Like the chapters are much longer and do different things. No, not for better or worse. It just is, it's different. <laughs> yeah. You're the second author who writes on your cards. <laughs> We've done an event with this month, actually. That's really oh, that's funny. Yeah. It's brought to you by index cards, you know? <laughs> yeah, the sponsored event, of course. Uh, <laughs> sponsored by Grub Street and index cards. Um, so do, 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 I will go into this question next. So did anything surprise you when writing this book? Yeah, I mean, it took a while for me to realize this is going to, I'm, I'm going to sound like a complete idiot, but like I was drawn towards this priest living out of his car in pursuit of this thing. I wanted him to hold some of these strange theological ideas, but it really took me a long time to understand the relationship between like his own denial and his theological denial, like much longer than you would hope, like not, you know, but like, it, it, it really did take a second. And when that clicked together, then I realized, okay, this is something I can keep working on. It's starting to justify itself a little bit more. Um, so yeah, that and like some of the revenge plot stuff, um, I really like had to discover and think about and work on. Um, and I think like that priest, that e the evil priest, um, he was there, but he was more of a ghost kind of haunting the narrator and uh, I realized it like was it's much more interesting if he confronts him and and we get to see him a little bit. So that took all that that popped up fairly late in the process, I would say. Hmm. And it's I don't want to spoil it, but that's it's such an amazing piece of writing that when when they do. Well, thanks, Andrew. So I think we have time for about two more questions. So I'm going to move on to this one. Um, Cindy asks, I flashed on Dante and his relationship with Beatrice via Father Dan's relationship with Anna. She met her at the attraction, the deepest dark pit. So I wondered if Dante's rings of hell sprang to your mind. Um, did you want to invoke Dante by having Father Dan undertake a Dante-esque sort of spiritual journey? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, especially with like, you know, the via negativa or, or apophatic theology, right? Like at the end of the Divine Comedy, right? Uh, the the kind of pilgrim looks up at God and there's no, he has no language, right? It fails him in that kind of last moment. Um, so I kind of kept that in my head. The, the, the whole to hell is definitely kind of like Dante-esque in my mind and is a little like mini Inferno. Um, yeah, but I, I, I love this. What's that? Just an old well. Just an old well, right. Um, but I mean, it's like, that is one of the great kind of, you know, pilgrim narratives. And it, I, I did read it while I was working on this, but I think it leaked in in ways that uh, are more kind of textural. I didn't, I didn't have it at the front of my mind, I guess. Um, but I like that. I like that take. That's cool. Questions to me. <laughs> um, great. So I think this will be our last question. Um, what is a takeaway you hope readers will have after reading your book, if anything? Yeah. You know, takeaway. Well, uh, I think, uh, I hope it's a point of entry if, if somebody is kind of interested in these kind of like spiritually creative figures from especially like medieval and early Christian history. I hope that they, you know, they can th pick up like, like Bernard McGinn has this great huge series on mysticism. That is really, really cool. There are some, uh, there's a collect like anthologies about kind of topics in mysticism. I think the Oxford, there's the, this Oxford anthology that's really neat. I hope people can, or the Desert Fathers. I hope that like people can kind of find some of these texts that Dan loves and that I love too, honestly, even someone like Thomas Burton and, uh, and dig in. 
and find some little companions um, in this kind of messy, funky thing we're all doing. Perfect. It's life is what I'm getting at, I, I suppose. <laughs> messy, uh, funk. Yeah. Funky mess. Yeah, the funky mess of life. Well, I, I think life is a great place to end. <laughs> um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I just, before we, before we close, I just want to take a moment to thank our wonderful speakers and all of you for spending your evening with us and continuing to show up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Please make sure to check out Via Negativa at the link in the chat or visit our website where we have it right on the front page. So thank you again for your time and your support and for spending. Oh, yeah. It's also cool for America. I've got it on deck. So make sure you get a copy of Andrew's latest. Yeah, Ooh. check out both books. Please. <laughs> um, so have a great night, everyone. Um, and please stay well. I know it's hard, but please stay well. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Right, I really appreciate it. In the chat. Bye, America. Bye.